Hello. Welcome, everyone, to the latest monthly EFF Austin meetup. My name is uh, Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. For those of you who are first-time uh, watchers um, and wondering what EFF Austin is, we are an Austin-based digital civil liberties organization closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation out of San Francisco. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, EFF or Electronic Frontier Foundation, they are the nation's oldest and largest digital civil liberties advocacy organization. They're involved in uh, protecting your um, uh, legal rights in emerging technological spaces, especially your First and Fourth Amendment rights. They do activism around things like net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, and various other things to make sure your rights to speak and express yourself in digital spaces are protected. Um, so yeah, um, so if you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, much like last uh, month, we were having issues with our normal live streaming at uh, Capital Factory. Um, so uh, apologies to anybody who wanted to watch the stream live. Um, I was literally informed this morning that everything was good, and unfortunately it is not. So I will continue to work at Cat Factory to try to hopefully have a functional live stream for next month for everyone. Um, so yeah, just to give people quick little updates about what we have going on. So for those of you who are new to us, the main thing we do is our monthly meetups, which are the uh, second Tuesday of every month uh, at 7 p.m. in downtown Austin at Capital Factory, which is on the ground floor of the Omni Hotel. You can find out more information at our website, effaustin.org. You can also follow us on, meter, uh, on Meetup, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. We have a mailing list as well. There's various ways to stay in touch and be informed about what we're going to be doing. Um, August um, meetup, I tentatively have booked as our speaker, Bijoy Goswami with Bootstrap Austin. I'm still hashing out the exact topic he's going to talk about, but he's a very insightful guy. I'm always uh, delighted to pick his brain on literally anything, so I don't think we can go wrong there. Also, in early talks about having a presentation uh, from Erica Braverman about web accessibility standards for the September meetup. So I encourage you all to check that one out. Um, yeah, those are. We don't have any alternate events coming up other than those two at the moment. Um, but yeah, we um, we tend to have a lot of uh, stuff going on, and we're a community-based org. So I encourage you to uh, reach out and get involved if these uh, you care about these issues and are passionate about them. Um, yeah. So I think without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. I always like to get the bio accurate, so let me just pull that up here Thanks. real quick. Do, do, do. Apologies for everyone watching for slight disorganization. As I said, I was not anticipating trying to save our live stream at the last second. <laughs> so let me just pull this up here. Okay, so our speaker this month uh, is Xander Smith. Xander's been creating and delivering custom DevOps solutions for six years that test GDPR, SOC2, and PCI compliance. He also enjoys brewing beer, playing guitar, and coding arcade games in his spare time. And the um, reason I have Xander here talk to us today is because there is a very important data privacy law based out of uh, the EU you may have heard of called GDPR. It is probably the way it most directly impacts your daily life is a lot of those ubiquitous banners on websites about accepting or rejecting cookies or a direct consequence. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks for having me here. Appreciate EFF uh, uh, supporting this and all y'all all coming out. We have a small crowd here because it is still COVID days, but it's good to have people here er, once again. As mentioned, I'm talking about General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. This, for all its boring sounding name, is weirdly important because the EU has done a lot of stuff with it. Yes, it's an EU law, but that doesn't mean it doesn't apply. All right, let's run and through some of this. So before I start, I do have to do the disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Please consult a legal counsel if you have any legal questions. You can ask me some general stuff, but legally, not a lawyer can't tell you, you know, that this is the law. Also, the law is very subject to change. We have seen shifts in how it's enforced, what is, is being enforced, and other things. So you do need to keep a, abreast of the current law as it comes. This, everything that I'm showing should be current as of July 2022, but we expect to see law changes, especially in the U.S., 
within the next year. I will also add that I am also not a lawyer, but there are several lawyers on the EFF Austin board. If you have actual legal tech issues, I will direct you to them. I'm just a programmer who cares about these issues. Yeah, I'm just a guy who likes making solutions with programming, but this does come up a lot in my daily work. Once again, Xander Smith, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. So, you know, stupid joke about GDPR, why does everybody get this face? Well, because it's complicated and weird. And another stupid joke I shamelessly stole off the internet. Do you know a good GDPR consultant? Yeah, I do. Can you give me his email? No. If you don't get that, you will by the end of the presentation. All right, so let's take a hypothetical example. I make a company this year, July 2022, called Omni Consumer Products. Those of you that get the reference, congratulations. Pat yourself in the back. It's going to be a plant-based mission and focused nutrition, you know, meal in a can service. Very simple. We put a bunch of things like soy and lentils in a can, give you oh, a, a meal in the can, and send it to you. Our revenue is 300000 That's pretty good. We sold a lot of units that year. Works out to about 120,000 units at $2.50 a piece. Expenses were something like 280000 Profit was $20,000. Um, for just simplicity, we're going to... Sorry, I've got my notes on the same thing. There we go. We're going to make this say in Colorado for you know legal reasons because Colorado does seem to have some nice business as items, and we're going to do simple stuff like collect a mailing list and have a newsletter and talk to a lot of people about what we do, and in doing so, you know maybe we find the problem that is we're not getting a whole lot of revenue, and so we make the choice to look at our data and say you know there's other health-based startups here in Colorado who would love to see some of these people that we already cater to. It just makes business sense to sell some of their data or even give it away. So we take our current data from this huge mailing list we've gotten from the 10% off uh, option we've given on our website, and suddenly we have hundreds of thousands of emails from a variety of different users that we're giving away or selling to other companies. Next year, it's 2023, July, and we're fined $160,000 due to something regarding some EU privacy law? What happened? How did we get fined basically half our revenue by doing this? So unfortunately, if you sell all the info to companies without the consent of the person that has given the info and has given pure opt-in, you're subject to a data privacy a thing from the EU called GDPR. Now, if this happens whether you are in Europe, whether you sell to Europe or anything. It happens when you do anything regarding EU citizens and their data. So it doesn't have to be a majority of EU citizens. It does not have to be anything regarding an EU business. It is simply that you took EU citizens' data and used it improperly in some way and did not protect it in some way as well, because data breaches also qualify that. You didn't have to sell products to the EU in this hypothetical situation. We did not sell products X to the EU. We just took US addresses. But this is just hypothetical, right? This isn't going to happen. You're some small business. No, I'm way too lazy for that. I went and found a real example. This is Emma's diary from Lifecycle Marketing. This literally happened to them. Technically, it happened in the UK, which is as, uh, using the ICO oh, for their courts. Basically, a, the company here went and sold a large variety of marketing data that they collected from the Emma's Diary site to a variety of other air places, and they were fined 160,000 pounds. Right now, that works out to somewhere around 220,000 pounds. It's a, not, it's a lot of money for a small company. Many small companies, if you're operating, a, this is a blog site. This is not something that's a huge Facebook or Amazon. This is probably at least half of their revenue for that year. As you can see, they're still in business and still running, but they got hit pretty hard and they've even changed their, their name. They used to be Lifestyle, and, and so in order to change over to get rid of some of that bad press, I believe, they've changed to life cycle Marketing. So the other point here is that could totally happen even if we were in a Colorado company because Colorado has already passed the Colorado Privacy Act. By July 2023, you will be under that if you're a Colorado company. So just like we saw with the UK doing this earlier, we're going to expect that Colorado will do exactly that to companies that operate in Colorado and don't handle data privacy properly. It's kind of positive, but it does mean a lot of enforcement and changes and what you need to do as a small business. All right, this is the boring part. I will try to be pretty quick with this. As usual, the best thing you can do is refer to GDPR.eu, which is where they have all 99 articles that you can read for yourself. I'm gonna to try to keep the summary very quick. All right, so GDPR says the following things very briefly. 
They want lawful, fair, and transparent processing. So you can't just gather data for no reason. You need to gather data for a specific reason. You need to handle the data properly, and you need to let other companies and users see what you're doing with the data within reason. All right, you also are limited in what you can collect. You have to have a reason for what you're collecting. You have to tell people why you're collecting it, and then you should not get any more data than necessary. This is kind of good, especially as an IT professional. We used to collect huge amounts of data on people for no reason that we didn't even know anything about. Now at least there's a legal reason to go, no, that's just ridiculous, and go consult with legal if you have a problem with me saying this is out of compliance. Now I'm backed up by legal. Probably my favorite part of GDPR. Data subject rights. So the subject, whoever's getting this data, has the right to ask who, whichever company and what they're doing with it, what they plan to do with it, and they can object to it as well as also remove the data. Consent. You have to get consent from the person who's giving the data, and it has to be written and recorded. If there's a data breach, it has to be a notified to the customers within 72 hours. This is a bit new and surprising. We usually see within a month for a lot of laws, if ever. Uh, plenty of companies have been horrendous about this. I believe, if I recall correctly, Yahoo had a six months gap between their data breach and actual customers, which basically made it so that the customers had nothing they could do about it. Whereas within 72 hours, you can probably can passwords and do other things to try to stem the flow of your data. Privacy by design, again, kind of nebulous. This one's supposed to be that you make a private website that, that keeps track of private data separately and safely. Uh, this is probably the only thing I can point out with blockchain is actually very useful for this, but you can also totally do that with a private database as usual. Um, so data protection impact, you've got to also understand what data you're taking in and what it does. Transfers, not only can you get rid of your data, but you can transfer your data. And then, and it needs to be in a normal readable form. Number nine, my other favorite, they're now is suddenly a position for a data protection officer. Suddenly we have another person who has to be in your company of certain sizes, and they have to handle that data. So, do you have a question? Uh, I was curious as to what benefit the blockchain has. Oh, sure. So, blockchain in general can do most things that databases can do, but secure automatically. And the main answer is going to be that blockchain can separate out the ability to access things. So usually in a database, I have a password, I get everything, and that's all. I can, as a human user, pull stuff. Blockchain in theory, again, blockchain depends on which blockchain you're using and so forth, can give you a single key that gets that single piece of data that then could also pull even more data basically in a chain of information using that same key. Again, it depends on implementation, but it would make it so basically, instead of giving you the, oh, the key to everything, so let's say this is a building, and I give you the master key, that's usually what a database is like. I give you that master key, that's all. You've got ever access to everything that's really insecure. Blockchain by design says there are no master keys. You have one key for each room in the building, as it were, and you made those rooms may connect and have, have some sort of way they can get to other rooms, but if it has a locked door, there's one key and you can maybe copy it at best. So it prevents basically this kind of, it's compartmentalization for ships as we used to do them. It prevents this large wide breach by having a single master key. Okay, thank you. Certainly, yeah. It, it's a very interesting technology, just applying it seems to be the hard part. And it's not easy, there's a lot of math to it. All right, so. I'll also just add that uh, we tend to like Socratic discussion in these meetups, so by all means, uh, yeah. ask any questions. <laughs> so. I don't know. Sure, yeah. I know you kind of discussed it in a broad sense. Um, are there any implementations that you know of using a specific blockchain? And I'll uh, caveat that with uh, Bitcoin and Axie. Sure. So I was just curious as to what others might be using, uh, what blockchains. So far, I don't know of any that have implemented it for GDPR. That said, there's nothing stopping you from basically doing what we do with NFTs now for everybody's GDPR data at a disgusting cost. And that's the biggest problem I'd say right now is the reason we see blockchain not implemented is both the smaller, newer, cheaper blockchains don't have developers. The newer, bigger ones have these gas fees and other things that are so expensive that make it difficult, if not impossible, to implement. And then finally, we also just it's an infancy thing. We've seen databases from literally the 70s. We know they're safe. IBM has COBOL databases from Social Security. When we put those O's in, we know they're battle tested. I expect that people don't, and understandably, don't necessarily trust these new things, especially with things like rug pull. I don't know if anyone saw Squid Coin or Squid King Coin. That was fantastic. The guys basically sold $2 million of the coin, never let anyone else sell back, and left with the money. They don't have to. But well, yes, they, they certainly can be. They are. 
99. They often are. I'm sorry. Bitcoin network, you know, is in the exaflops. Exaflops, yes. So it's, it's particularly difficult. And that's also some of the problem, too, is as you get up into these wider networks that have more time in them, it also costs more to operate. And, and I will add that these fees are really quite substantial. Even mm -hmm. a network that's not a scam like Ethereum, the one time I did a transaction on it. <laughs> well, fine. <laughs> we can go back and forth all the way. Okay. Right. But say, bring out Some, Bitcoin. If you're scam. not a Bitcoin maximalist, fine. But um, yeah. but basically, I mean, a two hundred dollar transaction, I had to pay seventy dollars in fees if it wasn't going to take three weeks. That's not viable for real world use cases. Yeah, that's more the Western Union, which is weird because Western Union is a centralized <laughs> bank that. It doesn't want to clear these things unless you pay them. Yes? Thankfully, I'm going to ask a question about GDPR. Sure. <laughs> I mean, these are still relevant, too. So, but under what theory does one you know, political group be able to find people that are in another political jurisdiction? That's a great question. Because I, I still have never figured out why I should pay anything, any fine from Europe if I happen to be domiciled. So the simplest answer is you're technically correct. If you're never going to do business in Europe, you can probably get around this. And also, we've seen companies do this. Uh, I'll be doing the fines later. But Google Ireland is technically separate from Google Google and Alphabet, their parent company. And as far as I can tell, has literally just tanked Google, uh, Google Ireland to get around the required fine. So if you're never going to do business in the EU, and you also don't expect that you can and you know, have this enforced by your government, yeah, you're probably within your rights of not worrying about it. It's essentially a diplomatic incident. So you're saying that the U.S. government is not enforcing the GDPR? As far as I understand, not at this time. However, it's worth pointing out that we will have at least five states that will be enforcing GDPR-like laws within a year. So this is coming whether you like it or not in the U.S., and you will be fined probably appropriately if you act poorly. Conversely, there's also a lot of tech work being created in the U.S. because suddenly even small websites have to have these benefits and abilities, this overhead as well. Yes? I'd like to hear the rest of the talk, but I do have another question. That's fine. <laughs> um, we just talked about the cross-Atlantic relationship. Yes. A trade agreement covering privacy between the U.S. and the EU uh, regarding privacy. Did that require the United States to do anything in terms of enforcing the EPR? Again, not that I'm aware of, this becomes the, the no, consultory legal counsel. Is that a privacy issue? No, I'm talking about the Different agreement one. that exempts U.S. companies from certain um, privacy safeguards over in okay. Europe because the U.S. agrees to do certain things um, from a litigious standpoint, gotcha. there, there's a specific trade agreement. I yeah, think, I don't, I don't and know. And it got totally revamped after the summer of Snowden. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, because we basically trade specific got, partnership? Well, that's the Pacific. Yeah, point. that was something else. That's Pacific. I have to the other point I'll is. I'll look it up. Let's keep going. That's fine, yeah. And the other point also I have is I haven't found anything on that that basically gives you shielding. The one thing that gives you shielding is being a company of under 250 people. And even that's not safety, that's just they're going to probably not worry about it as much. Didn't Facebook get hit with the GDPR fine? Yes, they did. Huge. Yes, we'll be, we'll be getting to that, yeah. yeah. As well as several other things, yes. For all the people at home, this is what you missed by now. <laughs> <laughs> the Colorado Privacy Act, I like, absolutely not the second state I've heard that is implementing potentially privacy act. Is that a pattern that we're going to look for? I would argue it's a pattern, it's we're at 10%. So you, you can look at that. We got five states. Oh. We got fifty states total. So every state individually uh, creating their own. That is what we expect. Again, U.S. does that whole thing with states are usually yeah. locally responsible for this sort of thing for their persons. Um, typically, we don't see a federal mandate for this. If we did, we probably would have seen it. Though, granted, we've been seeing a, a you know a political trend against such things, against net neutrality, etc. So. It depends. But yeah, that's what I expect to see is that states will start enforcing this more heavily. Texas may be one of the last ones. Granted, well, but... I, I actually have interesting info both oh. about that and about Texas. Great. So, so first of all, yeah, the, the reason it's happening by states is because, as you might have become aware of because of certain other recent events, there is no uh, enumerated right to privacy in the U.S. Constitution. So yes, it's likely going to be a state-by-state -state basis. What do you mean? Fourth Amendment here. No, it's not uh, the right to privacy. No, that's just unreasonable search and seizure. Yeah. 150 countries on Earth actually have an explicit amendment granting a right to privacy. Our 
case law has only been inferring it, but due to recent events, it's unknown if that's going to hold up much longer. The other thing I can tell you about Texas is Texas was floating the data privacy law in the last legislative session. It did not pass. It might actually be a good thing it didn't pass because all it did was make it where government agencies can't abuse your data. Private companies were still allowed to do anything they want. Um, Texas does actually have the Biometric Privacy Act, but all it does okay. is require companies to let you know. Okay, and that's biometric specifically too? Yeah, that's okay. It's worth pointing out that yeah, the GDPR the, comprises more than that. So yeah. that is a good point. Uh, the the usually, tried to sue Facebook over it. Right, and the other thing is also just that, that's another thing that if you have a 250 or fewer employee list and you have biometric data, you are not safe. The, the GDPR covers you and you can be fine because it is sensitive health data. Nice. Yeah, so it's a little bit. Anyone else before I go into the, the more personal stuff here about what you can do with this? Hopefully this will answer a few questions, but if you have more, that's great too. We'll have a moment for questions and answers and just after this. Are these people to be secure in their person's house, papers, or facts against unreasonable searches and seizures to not be violated? How is that not right for Well, I agree, so, but the Supreme Court does not agree. Also, letter of law versus <laughs> implementation of law. Make any decision not allowed to be searched or seized. But that's only, that doesn't protect you in other forms of privacy. So Facebook is not searching or seizing anything of mine. I am handing it to them with some consent or not. Other websites, like my theoretical, you know, Huel startup, maybe taking my data and selling it off without ever searching or seizing in it at all. Again, not a lawyer, definitely should consult someone on that. I agree that it's a general idea of privacy, but the implementation of the letter of the law is not the same as we've seen in other countries that have this concept of privacy separate from search and seizure. And traditionally, the fourth combined with the ninth, which implied unenumerated rights, was how the right to privacy from Griswold was girded. The Supreme Court has thrown this into question by saying you can't use the ninth to imply privacy with unenumerated rights. Okay. Learning something new here. So, thank you. I appreciate the discussion, too, because those are important things. We're going to see a lot of this, and we do expect that the federal government will have a hand in this somewhere. All right. As an individual, there's a few things that GDPR actually does let you do that we didn't see before, and a lot of websites are just doing this as a courtesy slash they expect to need to. So you can suddenly take control of your personal data, you can opt out of all these mailing lists, you can remove your personal data from things, things that you know, otherwise shouldn't have it, or even if they should have it, you can say, I don't want this anymore. You can prevent your data from being sold without express written consent, very important. Cambridge Analytica is a great example of basically selling a lot of that data and doing questionable things with it, at, even, as well as also Facebook being involved in that. You can back up your data and move to another company specifically under GDPR. They have to provide a machine readable system. At the very least, CSV seems to be the bottom line. You can provide other things that are within reason. They can't just provide you a broken PDF or something, but they do have to provide some way to machine read it so you can just transfer stuff. Um, you can also expect that companies are going to take this a bit more seriously. Previously, companies have not cared much about what they do with your data besides make money from it. You are going to deal with a lot of websites requesting your consent. We'll look at a few of those later and what you can do. And of course, also be informed about data breaches within 72 hours. Something to, it is important to me because, yeah, 72 hours is short enough that I can do something. Six months, that password's gone, that data is gone. It's compromised. There's not much I can do. As an employee, you can help out with this. It's kind of important to do so. Just don't collect data you don't need. One of my personal favorites. Um, make your company agile and compliant with everything just so it moves forward. Companies that aren't, or we're going to see a few later here, that just weren't able to move very quickly with this and have subsequently also fallen out of favor in general. I can only imagine that's the same general problem, not that they didn't comply with GDPR, but that they weren't able to move with the market very well. And then also you want to avoid fines, but also put customers at ease by letting them know you're compliant. And of course, inform your company employees about data breaches as soon as possible so that you can inform customers. Finally, as a company, again, ensure you don't collect data without reason. All the same things, things, things as an employee. And granted, yeah, that's what you can do, but why should you care? There's a few things here. One is it's a great time to be doing data. If you wanted a job in data privacy, in data protection, in data engineering, this has made a lot of work for those people, for better or for worse. I, I, I generally think it's for better. We're going to see a lot more control out of what privacy is, how we handle it, and what we can do with it. Uh, the regulations are sweeping and rather positive for individual privacy. Any company that works with EU data is affected. And of course, the fines for non-compliance are huge. This is usually the one that gets all the press. So here's five big companies. As you can see, yeah, a lot of them are tech focused, sure. But you don't have to be a tech giant to get hit by these different items. Marriott got hit 
about 21 million euros. H&M, which is fascinating, they did not actually collect customer data. That was employee-only data. They can, and only on a few hundred employees, and they still got slapped with a 35 million euro fine. They didn't even have to try very hard to do this. They just wound up getting hit very hard with it. Uh, according to Article 83, this is the usual legalese part, is you can be about 4% of your annual turnover, annual revenue, or 20 million euros, whichever is higher. Now, that's not immediately what they're going to find you. That's up to, but it's still a huge amount compared to many of these other laws that we've ever seen. These are some of the biggest, most expensive legal cases we've ever seen applied, and it's being applied by the entire government. I have an ignorant question about that. Sure. 4%, now granted, I know nothing about how businesses work, but that sounds extremely low to me. Do businesses usually have a very small profit margin? or It's not profit, it's revenue. So it's it's gross. It's whatever you make just hands down. It, it, so Amazon is a good example. Amazon for okay. 25 years something has never literally in the books turned a profit. And this is how they avoid taxes in many cases. So they... So 4%, I mean, you got to understand, yes, it's not 10% where, or double that, and that's a waiter's tip. But 5%, I mean, so even with the theoretical company we had, 4% and was approximately a $40,000 plus plus, and, you know, continues to, the other thing is you get stuck in legal fees. And again, this is not profit. This is however much you made revenue. But I guess my concern is, what, does that cut into profits? Because, call me cynical, I'm a believer that's the only way you're going to use companies. That example, their profit was that, so they're underwater. So it, is that is that it, like a realistic? It's the same. That one was realistic because I pulled it specifically from oh, okay. numbers, and that one. It, the other problem is, yeah, this kind of hits small businesses a bit harder than it should. But it so does still hit large businesses. It hits large businesses. Okay. These are also unprecedented from other legal cases. So gotcha. we never saw Amazon take a 70, 746 million euro fine before. Gotcha. They've never done that with anything. Emissions, cars, other problems, whatever they may be in. It's never been that one fine, and that it's been enforceable as well. And I'll just point out that, like, you know, that, um, yeah, actually, any law with real teeth that's actually going to punish somebody is going to hit revenue and not profit. This is the same trick certain people in Hollywood use to actually get paid. You wonder why Robert Downey Jr. is worth so much? Because he gets a percent of Marvel's gross, mm -hmm. not their profit. That's I, why I guess I just want to make sure it's actually hitting them where it hurts. So, oh, yeah. You know, it does hurt. I agree with you that it is not probably enough. And as I'll go through with the failures of GDPR, it probably needs to be discussed what more we can do. But it is interesting in that we've actually seen companies struggle with this already, especially just the big fish are being hooked here. As shown, we have, you know, WhatsApp certainly felt 225 million. If they didn't have Facebook as a parent company, that would have been a huge blow to them. British Airways is not a, a huge company anymore either. But yes, they, this is a, a, you know, an airplane company. So, oh, they feel it a lot. And H&M also, yeah, 41 million for them. I mean, yes, they're a design re retailer and have a lot of things that they bring in for revenue, but it hits. Okay. And I think also, yeah, if 4% may not be what we see going forward, but we've been able to enforce 4%. I think that was some of the point was to have a law that's enforceable, that's not just all bark and no bite as it were, because 20% would be so high up there that they're never going to hit that maximum. Got gotcha. a question. So these companies, do they deliberately sell customer data regardless of what they thought the repercussions were going to be? It depends on the company. So the basic answer you're seeing here for most of these is not even customer data sold. It is improper usage of EU data and no consent therein. So basically everybody it, decides it sounds like it, it could have been an easy mistake. That they just That's one of the data. problems and why we're talking here, I think, is because it's easy to make that mistake and then even if you're and then if you're a large company, it's easy to get hit with that mistake. Is that you took in EU citizen data, you didn't store it in EU citizen and requirements, usually EU servers in that case, and you didn't keep it private and protect it and have them have the consent. And suddenly you're on the hook for literally millions of euros. That's really damaging in just as that it could be very cheap to have done that from the start, but We've got a product that is, you know, Facebook is older and maybe harder to code that in. They obviously have put a lot of money into it, but. So, so rather than the customer saying, hey, don't do this with my data, has GDPR considered maybe maybe making some security protocols that companies can follow instead? So again, you can look at the 99 articles. They do give some general information about what you should do, how you should do it but they've left the implementation as an exercise to the reader for better or for worse. So there's no like golden rule standard practice that everyone should follow? Not That's complicated. So <laughs> there is no, it is not SOC 2 or PCI, 
where I can go, here is the book, do it this way. Some of that is because GDPR is quite new, whereas PCI and even SOC 2 have been around a little while. The other point also is it's a law rather than a compliance standard, which therefore is a bit more nebulous because they want to be able to enforce it a bit more widely, I expect. Right. So that, that is a problem I agree with. And yeah, the, this is the main thing I see with small businesses is it's very easy to start up a small business, make some mistakes and run afoul of this law or other privacy laws that are probably more likely. Because again, to be honest, we're probably not gonna see some Colorado website if it's advertising dude ranches or healthcare or whatever, run afoul of EU standards, but they will start hitting Colorado privacy A standards that will probably hit them with that. And a like, side point, and this, to me this seems a way to just the bottom up the middle class too. Because it's those kind of businesses that are going to be here from us. Like 4% and their profit and their revenue compared to Facebook is, I mean... Well, yeah, so, and everything I've read, yeah, these are the legitimate criticisms of the law. And mm -hmm. I'll just say, yeah, as a programmer, a lot of these small business websites, they're not writing always their own code. They're going to throw in some third-party JavaScript to do X. It's actually that plugin that's stealing all the data, actually. Right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Thankfully, if, it's your, if you have your stuff on someone else's, you can often declare that there's a boundary of basically trust that says this company should have done their job and GDPR should go after them. We've seen cases on that, but conversely, if you're restoring your own data or controlling yourself, there's a number of in-EU cases with simply just people that are attorneys, dentists, etc., that are being fined a reasonable amount. Again, it's not 4% of your entire revenue. It is up to that. And so the, the courts have to decide how much they plan to fine you. Which is its own complication. I don't realize 4% was the ceiling. That is the ceiling. So, or 20 million euros, whichever is higher. That is the ceiling that is not the requirement. I also had the problem with that before. Um, but at the same time, yes, that is, it's still a lot. And it's still, it, you can expect that if you're a small business, this can tank your company. That, you know, at the very least, you get so much bad press about your data problems that it, it will be unable. So that's a fair question. What is, you know, is all oh, press good press? I know we have a number of stories about Uber recently. We'll see. Sometimes these things also may shift perceptions. It may not be that Uber completely tanks tomorrow and I can go short the stock and make millions of dollars. But it may make people choose Lyft or Austin Co-op Taxi in their mind because they know that Uber is not doing a good job. The other point I should make on that is, all right, fine, it's not going to change Uber's taxi service, but Uber Eats has just spent God knows how much money trying to advertise to me alone, let alone everybody else else that I know. And that's probably going to be where you see some of that damage is that, all right, fine, I'm willing to give my location information, but I'm not sure I want to give out all my information about how I shop and what that does. I might think twice about that. It's not perfect. None of this is. This is a law. We're trying our best to do well with it. And I agree, it needs to probably be expanded within safe and reason. And yeah, enforcement on this has been interesting because we are seeing big fish get caught, but at the same time, it can be damaging to small companies and just doing that enforcement is costly. And just a fun side note on Uber, given that I've uh, spent enough time in France that I fully appreciate this. So you may have heard a lot of the big Uber scandal is related to their president, Emmanuel Macron, personally mm. heavily lobbying for Uber. Fun fact, there is no Lyft in France. There's only Uber. So it's actually probably going to suck for Macron a lot more in the short term than Uber. Sure. And that's somehow sometimes how we have to dismantle that structure as well. Is that, yes, that it may not immediately cause change. But we can keep moving forward with this. I think, honestly, the EFF Austin sees this where increment, small incremental change, like we love to talk about in software, is the one way to get changes to happen. But for now, yeah, it's probably going to hit the middle class hard. And it's going to make a, companies that are small struggle with things or choose to go to things like WordPress or Wix or whatever website builder thing they have for better or for worse. Because they're not going to get their own data protection officers. 
No. So they're going to most likely be dependent on service providers. So is it not part of the due diligence to make sure your service providers are keeping up? Yes, it is part of due diligence from my understanding and my visibility in DevOps especially. You have a good deal of basically deniability on your or provider, and especially if you've done your basic due diligence. They also sell literally insurance for this. I've, as a consultant, had to buy that insurance that basically says if I break something or if I, as a company, break something, here's the, in this case, million dollars that I put up as, as a bond from that insurance company that I pay 3000 and every six months, basically. Is it the, do you know, though, is it the responsibility of the business entity to be the one who asks and collects consent, or can you outsource that? You can certainly outsource that. Many people are outsourcing that to specifically MailChimp and other email servers. The thing is you do have to make sure they're collecting consent for each action, and they have to be able to report that back to you. So that's probably the biggest change. Previously, MailChimp just had to go, hey, so we verified this, cool, done. Yeah. Or you could just pull an entire, like, I don't know, 50,000 emails from some email server, or you know, they, any number of black market email servers, dark web things really do have piles of emails. Whether they're legitimate or useful is your problem, but you can buy them. These days, that's technically illegal, and doing that is not going to be an option for this. And if you have a company that's doing that for on your behalf, you can probably be hit up for it, but it's much more gray area because, again, deniability, security, et cetera. And this is actually a springboard on her question. But, sure. Um, so, like, let's say I'm a small company and I outsource the ubiquitous cookie banner to some third party. Yes. And the cookie banner is not in compliance. Is it my fault or is it the maker of the plugin to make the cookie banner's fault? So, again, you need to consult a lawyer for this to, to be very accurate. <laughs> but in general, what I'm seeing is that it is the, the, the company that makes it for you, especially in the case that you are a very clearly separate company. If you are not an IT shop, you are clearly not doing that. If you're not running that server, you're less and less likely, and people will probably take that avenue as a simple way out rather than be concerned about compliance. And as much as that's great to make work, I'm not a huge fan of no-code apps or Wix personally, so we'll see how that goes. Yes? Just to add on to that, I think that's why they established a big function officer as well, is to have someone who is supposed to look over what all the other guys are doing. Correct. That's primarily one of their main functions along with just checking what you're doing and doing compliance. And I think Much of it is, I mean, again, we've also seen that EU is willing to go after chains of these things, and even the U.S. is willing to go after chains of security, or more recently, I think that we've seen there's a lot of push to work with U.S.-centric firms because security concerns have been so bad. Typically, almost every data breach has been from a third party, a majority of them at least. And that's just kind of the nature of things. The third party is smaller, it's less, more likely to be hacked, and it's more likely to have some sort of sensitive data that may not be all of the customer's sensitive data, so you're more likely to be able to get to that. And of course, it was already mentioned, and I know from experience, you're a small startup, you may not even have one of these uh, data protection officers. You most likely are having your CLO or your general counsel take care of it, along with all the other legal stuff they do. Yeah, or you're not DevOps. necessarily an expert on compliance with this, or DevOps. Or we're DevOps, which is what happens to me, is I come in and go, you can't do this, this isn't GDPR. And they go, why do we care? And I go, because California's already implemented this, and we're going to see every other state do it. The UK's done it. And again, it does not matter whether you're in a EU country, it's you're dealing with EU citizens, and now soon will be certain state citizens and UK citizens who all have this data privacy requirement set that you need to be compliant for. And thankfully, if you design forward, it can be okay. It's not easy, but it's important. Now, that said, I do need to point out, I don't think we're here. Yeah, okay. So, objections to the usual problem here. I did have these ready. So, if you're... <laughs> so, if you're a small business that has low revenue, no profit, do note that this is all based on revenue, and the ceiling, of course, is 20 million euros. But most companies under 250 employees are not subject to this unless they're collecting very specific types of data, including healthcare or criminal all data. Now that said, be aware that Britain totally sued that blog, uh, Emma's, Emma's List and so forth, without them ever really collecting a whole lot of data, if only because they were certainly doing things that were, were involved with healthcare. They were specifically recommending products for pregnancy, giving advice about uh, pregnancy and other you know, young child, child development things, which may have gotten them a bit a harsher fine. And it's life cycle, run life style. Yeah. Just a further delineate. Yes, so it, lifestyles, low marketing now, life cycle marketing, they've changed right. names. Yeah. So. Like avoid the healthcare aspect of it. Yes. 
That, that's a fair point. Yeah, you're right. The yeah. lifestyle would be much more healthcare centric. And as mentioned, also, even if you're a company that's just collecting employee data, and granted, H&M apparently collected all sorts of questionable, fun employee data and lots of surveys and other things that were kind of intrusive, but they still only collected it on about 500 employees, and H&M has 155,000 employees. They didn't do this on everybody. They did this on a select like beta group and still got fined really heavily. So you aren't necessarily safe in a lot of these cases if you're a large company. Small companies under 250, you're more likely to get away with it and, or like, just not have to worry about it until you're mature. But the other point also is, as usual, if you design it and then it becomes this kind of calcified, crystallized design that you're already doing this and you know the guy who built it on Ruby on Rails left a year ago and you're desperately trying to keep up with the website, you're out of luck and building it and again is costly and expensive. So designing from the start toward this privacy may be a better choice if you want longevity. Yeah? It says there are expected to be exempt. Is there some future ruling? <laughs> so <laughs> again, this is one of those things that's very a, a gray area. Yeah, so we expect that basically if you're not a company that collects healthcare data, you're okay in EU. And we haven't seen a whole lot of things from small businesses in the EU. They've been minor fines at best. I can, attorneys, dentists, you can look all this data up on, again, gdpr.eu. They literally have all the cases from a variety of other or different and countries within the EU itself. UK, it's been certain very specific ones. I could find about six examples that are actually quite rare for small businesses and under 250 employees, extremely rare. This law is clearly designed to, and it's much easier to enforce on the larger companies. That said, it is completely within the judgment of the court for this, whether it's the ICO or the EU, court as to whether you're exempt or not. Got it. You call it a law, but isn't it mostly regulation? Like 90% of it is actually regulation made up by the U.S.? Are, are you basically asking, is it, I think maybe the question is, was it passed by the European Parliament as a legislative act, or is it part of the EU's executive administrative body creating regulations? Is it executive or legislative? So if I recall correctly, and I may have to check this just to make sure I don't misspeak, but yes, it's passed by the EU Parliament. Okay, so it is legislation. It is now legislative, but it was regulative. It's like many of our agencies, right? There's like the thing where they say, hey, you can go do this, and then they let you go do it. Well, actually, an excellent... It's an actual, like, bill equivalent. Right, that's what I understand is why it's a regulation. But, okay. but, to, but this, to your clarify now, because the first couple of years it was out, nothing really, you know, it was contradictory, in fact, in a bunch of places. I mean, it, it may just, have, I mean, who would lie on the internet or disseminate misinformation? <laughs> no, I can't imagine. But, um, yeah, okay. I mean, fair, you know, so, I mean, but yeah, I think, I think a good analogy would be it's very similar to, say, Congress passes a law about net neutrality or not, and then it's up to the FCC to implement, um, and they get a lot of discretion because of Chevron deference about exactly how they go about implementing it. I would imagine EU is probably fairly similar. So, yeah, that's been what I've seen. A quick Google search shows that it was passed by the Parliament itself. I expect that it was previously just a regulation that was floated and then was passed into law, but it may be very... It's a human right According to them, yes. This is, this is the question, is, is it a human right and how do we handle this? I'd like it to be, but we certainly see plenty of countries that are using data very differently and for questionable results. So, yes? I want to add, you might want to update your numbers because um, you're a dollar is so. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very recent so that's a fair core of currency point. parity. I mean, for future presentation. <laughs> so this number is an older number, so they're not yeah, quite parity. Oh, oh. So, <laughs> this was how much it was at the time. It was as GBP 32 million when during that exchange rate. And that's a fair point, too. If you could find, go find a good exchange house because apparently it matters a lot and they want it in euros. <laughs> so, yeah. If you go back to this, these are all numbers from when they were fine, not parity euros and so forth. So, some of these WhatsApp, for example, apparently was. They either managed to brokerage one to one or not. Amazon is clearly showing. Oh, I not. just noticed that. That's yeah. hilarious. It's, it's, it's really important to get the exchange rate right because it can matter a lot, as you can see. Also, just right. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is the joke, and it can be important, especially in the millions. I mean, you're looking at yeah, is four percent a lot? Well, four percent of seven hundred forty-one million is a ton of money. All right. Let's see if we can get it for it. So. I wanted to talk a few minutes about some poorly designed, well-designed content. We don't have to stay on this too long, but there are some nice examples 
and you like the penguin things, it's cute. So, as you can see, Mo did not have well-designed content, was the Naughty Penguin of the Month. All right, this is some of the good stuff. Uh, so, this is Playstack Publishing. They make it pretty easy. You can allow all cookies, you can disable all cookies, you can customize settings. They it's, allow a disable all button. They I do, yeah, them. it's fantastic. Google has it now in the EU. Oh, good. <laughs> so, yeah, it makes it very easy to get rid of. It's on the bottom banner, so it's not like intrusive like we'll see later. This is RSBPB, which is the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Again, another UK a unit, but they do make the what you're opting into very easy, and it shows you what your contact information is. That's the redacted stuff, and just whether you want to keep doing these different things. Is it still though? Do you do that? Well, it looks like this one's giving you. So there's some granularity to it. So you're supposed to provide granularity, or at the very minimum, you need to provide opt out completely. You don't necessarily have to provide granularity, it's just kind of a, a courtesy of the customer. And as we'll see, there is the way to do it as granularity as a non-courtesy to the customer if my laptop wants to work. Yes, those, those websites, I do not like those websites. <laughs> yeah, that... Oh, it has to, it relogs you in every time. Okay. Oh yes, it, it, it boots you after one hour. That's why I grabbed a PDF. Hey. <laughs> all right, so, all right. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, this is The Guardian on the left. I don't really like how they do any of their web design, but this is one of the worst, is that you're on mobile and it kind of pops up the entire bottom quarter as to whether you want to opt in. They're also very big on paywalls, for better or for worse. The paywall does give them a much better legal defense of you paid for it, so legally we're able to send you things as long as you didn't opt out. It's not that great a paywall. I can always get past it. <laughs> you can get past it, but a lot of people don't, and yeah, it's always an arms race like that. Um, this is MRS, another UK website. A lot of these are UK because they've been forced to move forward with compliance because the UK now has similar laws despite Brexit. Again, very simple. Yes, I'd like to keep receiving emails. No, I don't want to. Here's some of the bad examples. Guess where they're from? Yeah. <laughs> so here's Tumblr. Tumblr, th this is a truncated list. That is the A's. It makes you unsubscribe from every ad supplier they have. All 342 of them, I believe. One by one, checkbox by checkbox. According to the GDPR, new updates, this isn't actually legal. You can't do pre-filled checkboxes for anything. But again, gray area, American company, etc. This is Zoom. Zoom has no no on the options. There's just, yes, I'd like to keep getting email. And yes, I want one email a month. <laughs> <laughs> is Zoom just straight up breaking the law? There's no opt-out. So there is an opt-out further down the page. It is super hard to find. This is also an older example. They have updated it, thankfully. But yeah, that is based to straight up breaking EU GDPR. And again, these are examples targeted toward an American market, so they kind of could. But they'll need to clearly fix that, and Zoom has fixed theirs in, before they're compliant with EU stuff, unless they're going to get fined. And I mean, I'm sure that they're one of the big targets. They made a huge amount of money during the pandemic. And they are a large tech company that takes in huge amounts of data. And that may, seems to also be why they do well. Zoom does provide a different platform based on their data. I have a very specific question that's actually one of the reasons I wanted to pick your brain with this talk. Sure. Because it comes from my very specific hacker programmer mentality ethos. And I'm really curious what the law says about this. Okay. Um, so a lot of times when the ones give me that really annoying thing where there's no easy way to opt out, yes. generally anything on a web page that annoys me, I'll just go into my dev tools and delete the node responsible for it. What happens if I never click on the agree button? Great question. We do actually have answers for that. <laughs> if you never click the agree button, it never or gets the written consent, which means that you are not consenting and therefore they legally cannot keep your data. Yes, it does work. <laughs> it does work. You must opt in. It is an opt in only part. That is part of the regulation specifically. I did have to go look that up a lot. And I say, <laughs> only being partially sarcastic, is that a definite answer? Because that, that's a whole. Yeah. Okay. This, this is it. It's not not a lawyer, but you're yeah, pretty yeah, dang that's, sure. That's where I was going with that. That's fair, yeah. So, again, not a legal counsel. Cool. You should consult legal counsel. But everything I've seen, read, and understood as the information, the court cases I've looked at, because honestly, just full disclosure, my cousin runs a real estate company in California, and they were talking about building a website, and this was one of the discussions, is, is a free check checkbox legal? And in 2016, it was, back when he was doing that. Now it is not. And that's the same thing. If you don't get express written consent, you can show to the EU or the UK government or soon to be the different state governments, you will be subject to fines. If I don't do something in my browser that posts my consent to their server, <coughs> I didn't consent. Correct. So, like, ad blockers, like, 
do block origin and stuff. Yes. They have filters. It will just hide those things automatically. Mm -hmm. And so you can just hide them automatically. You, you can. See them. You never opted in. And then, yeah, you never opted in. Well, I'm very picky about which blockers I use because half the blockers are spyware. I basically use Privacy Badger because it's EFF. Dude, you should check out uBlock. It's great. uBlock is doing pretty well. I do Really? I read some stuff that they were beaming data somewhere sketchy. Yeah. So this is always the thing. Is they'll... Sorry? Yeah, uBlock Origins specifically. Yeah, uBlock Origins so I think there's another one called Yeah, there are a number. The other point also is, as with every company, I mean, Adblock used to be pretty safe and reasonable. They've upgraded, grown, and become a revenue stream, and that's... You know, right, I've read still... something where one of the U-blocks was great, and then they started doing something sketchy, but this was like six or seven years ago. I okay, yes, yeah, so I think that's it. Origin seems to be safe currently, again, okay, there's no or, problem origin, change origin, as it becomes a revenue source. stream. Right. Oh, Origin's open source, so we know if they... That have, yeah, that helps, too. Adblock okay. did go close. Yeah, that's that fantastic. He updated stuff, like... Immediately. All but, right, you block origin. I'll get back on it. <laughs> so yes, you can block these things, and then this is probably the least innocuous. Apparently, again, this is probably illegal because you're not directly opting in. As you can see at the bottom, we use cookies. If you agree with it, you, you sorry, you use our website, you agree with it. That's kind of a very tacit consent question. As far as I understand, that's not legal, but it is very convenient. Again, bottom banner very easy to work with. Questionable as to whether you can record that consent especially if you have somebody that you have an email address on. If you're just pulling IP information, that's complicated because you can argue that that is not a person, that is an IP address. <laughs> okay, uh, official question and answer. So do we have anything else right now? I guess the stuff that is, uh, do you know for California, is it they have to have written consent? Uh, at this time, yes, it should be written consent is required for opting in and their, and their privacy laws should be currently running. So. All the other states are currently expecting to run by, if not January 2023, July 2023. So uh, back on the 4% and yeah. the um, point 29, yeah. um, uh, fines, those are all government fines. Uh, they're still open to like, private, I guess, civil cases? Or, Absolutely. Right, so that's an additional doc on top of that? It can be. It depends. As we've seen, Google loves to do the whole mediation, arbitration, settle with people rather than do a long suit. Uh, they also have caveats within this. The H&M thing is appropriate. Basically, again, Google typically has a employee contract that says, look, you have to do arbitration with us. We're not going to let you sue us. And that would be even if there was just that group of employees saying Google 300, they did a, a, you know, a test pilot on that and kept their employee data, they'd still be subject to mediation. So you can civil sue these companies. It can be difficult to do. And they're also probably just going to wait you out as they often do. Uh, class action is probably the best way to handle that. If, and I think that's one of the other points too, is that class action is expensive for the individual even. And you know, just there is a cost to running these lawyers and keeping these things up. And so for a government to be doing this, essentially as a, a forward push, is very different from what we've seen elsewhere. Yeah. So uh, apologies if you already covered this. That's great. Um, that last one said, you know, we use cookies. Yes. Not tracking. Has that changed? So, like, if I have a you know a bulletin board, where mm -hmm. you have logged in users with session cookies, do I have to get consent to allow people to log in, or is that like just the logged in session cookies still allowed without the need for consent? Oh boy! So it really <laughs> depends on what you're All tracking. Right. I didn't know you already covered this. I did not cover this okay. beyond like there are cookies and you accept them. That's usually it. The best way to look at it as an individual is. If you're giving people cookies, you're probably needing to store that data safely. Again, if you can argue that this is bot traffic somehow, you can get around that into a gray area where it's bot traffic, you don't have to care. If it's a person, you know it's a person, you're collecting information data, and you're using any sort of cookie, you're on the hook because you collected their personal data as well. If you're doing so, tracking cookies as on top of that, which for, to be honest, basically all cookies are tracking cookies unless they only save data for your specific website, so that's what I'm saying. It's like I run a BBS yeah. like forum. Yep. And it is on a MySQL shared server. Yep. And it's like just kind of sitting there, and some people use it. Right. And there's you know posts and all that sort of stuff, and they create usernames and mm. they can, you know comment on whatever. Yeah. Um, and to log in, you know, you log in and sure. it sets you a session cookie, and that session cookie allows you to say, well, right. this is ABC user." And so like. When I go to that website, that's just like, it doesn't send any data anywhere else. It's just for the logged in forum. 
So, yep. like, in that case, is that a situation where I have to put this up? Because I was under the impression Technically, that it was yes. So, really? again, okay. you are probably a company of 250 people or under, yeah. or an individual, or this one. may be something <laughs> where you could just get yeah, or one or whatever, which you basically aren't really subject to this because you are a small enough company that is not dealing with healthcare data. As usual, you should consult a lawyer, but yeah, from what I've seen, you're not applicable because of that. That said, you should do that, and you should be forward-thinking in case your company becomes big you're enough like, to care. You know, I advertise that there is no tracking. There's no tracking, like you, like, there is no Google. Do you like, store whatever. logs anywhere on that server? Sure, I mean. Then there is tracking. Well, that's all I got, man. Okay. I, I've so done this I, long I enough. To as long as you don't use anything for tracking, you are not tracking. That's technically true, but that's not necessarily relevant. Tracking cookies are not the only requirement. There is also personal data of any sort that is applicable to GDPR. <laughs> tracking cookies are just worse, and they specifically are called out in that as you're not supposed to do that without express consent and reason to do so. So that, that's why they come up is they just, there's not a good reason to track your user data unless they give you consent for it a la Google where it's feed, feeding ads that you requested to you and they know what you're doing with it. What they don't want is Cambridge Analytica style stuff where they get this data, feed it over to somebody else for a completely different reason and then do questionable things with it. So it is still applicable, tracking cookies are worse and yeah, even as a, you're supposed to be able applicable even as any website, but if you're under 250 employees, you, according to this, you should be fine. It can be very gray in that case. Yes. So I, I'm going to build on that because I think that's fascinating. And so I want to interrogate the specifics of the law further there. So basically when, when the law is subject to collecting data on the user, is, is data on the user defined as any piece of data that originated from the user's browser or something uh, on their computer, and it doesn't have to be, I think, to get at Daniel's point, it doesn't have to be personally identifying in any way. It just has to be a blob of data that originated on the client that ends up on the server in a state. Yeah, that's technically that's different. what I understand. It doesn't have to be PII, as we usually define it with PCI and some other compliances. It, it could be a random string that is, doesn't even identify my computer. It's just a random string that is like, as he said, a session. Again, technically, yes. If you can't relate it to an EU citizen, then this is going to be very hard to enforce. But the simplest one is using tracking data to see how people browse your website or what, how long they take to click on a sale. And then being able to correlate that back. Um, one of the advertising companies is that I talked to in an interview here certainly discussed the idea that you were able to just by click patterns, figure out which users are using what website when and do that. And that's arguably within that boundary of you've collected data. The user has never really sent you anything. They've basically requested everything, but it's data collected on a specific person. So, I mean, so to get even broader there, basically, it, um, it basically, or well, so just a specific person. So is the law broad enough that it encompasses any data that a server receives from a client that the server persists in any fashion the law uh, applies? Again, as far as I understand, it is within that, but they're not really looking for that. So. But in theory, as the way the law is written, it is as broad as I just described. Yes, that's what I've seen. So Sorry, I'm trying to point, point, we pull it up, but of course the well, Wi-Fi is down. So it's my understanding yeah. that like, EU law is different from American law in that <laughs> EU law is intentionally designed to be interpretable, and American <laughs> law is intentionally designed to be very specific and to the letter, right? And so you can get out of American law through loopholes and stuff a whole lot easier than you can get out of under... Okay, I, I think that's correct. And I but think it also gives them a lot more... Again, I think, it's a, very, I think yeah. it's a consequence of their civil law, basically. Well, and remember, certain countries in Europe do not use Tory law as we do, where you get precedential cases. Spain, if I recall correctly, is under tort law, where it's whatever the law says, deal with it. Your lawyer can explain that and explain what you're doing, but it doesn't matter what other people happen. It matters what the judge thinks under tort law. It's much simpler, but can be much more damaging to, again, middle class persons and simple things where you can't hire a really good lawyer to get you out of that. So I think that's some of it is just certain EU countries do not come from this background of throwing tons of lawyers and having you know hundreds of years of law at it. They want to make this relatively simple for better or for worse too. And again, I think this is certainly done with GDPR. They wanted it to be broad and sweeping enough that they could hit companies that they knew were doing things wrong elsewhere. 
but could not necessarily be, get to that level. Oh, it's the whole Al Capone got uh, to, you know taken up for tax evasion, not for actually you know doing all these terrible things originally. Is that we we know big tech companies pull a lot of data. We may need to have a broad law in order to get even part of that in it. My question is, and this is kind of a silly question. It's okay. Is stuff being applied to a certain states when they're talking it. I guess it's more of a voluntary thing to say we're talking to you if you're on the floss. But like, with Brexit happening, I mean, I don't know what went into that and how much they were or were not still associated with the EU. But still, with Brexit happening, I, it makes sense that UK businesses had customer data that was, you know, mishandled, maybe by accident, maybe not, but still, it, it just is uh, ridiculous to me of how you have someone leaving the European Union, but yet they're still having to follow these rules, and this GDPR thing is relatively recent, right? Because Brexit was in 2016, right? Yeah, this GDPR so should be passed mean, around the same time, 2016 as well. Oh, uh, yeah. well, so. I... A so lot did of, it happen before the GDPR Act became legal? So, like, as far as I understand, Brexit was one of those things, and we may need to check dates here, timelines are important, where they have passed it and it's been implemented slowly, and so that's been some of the issues. The GDPR came on the scene and has been implemented at that time as well going forward. But more importantly, most of the sightings I have for UK problems are actually from UK, their, their own privacy laws that the UK has put together. And especially for the small businesses that I've discussed, that's been a UK privacy thing. Um, for the most part, Google Ireland is currently the only one that I can point to off the top of my head that's operating in Europe and got hit with a European fine. Okay. Yeah, so they are stopped applying to them after Brexit. They have their own regulations now. But, but that example, that anecdote about the blog, yes, that was all based on UK the privacy law specifically. Like so that was just an example of like, this is what this kind of block can look This is what we expect to see in the States, yeah. It's uh, basically Colorado, we expect to see that. It is a European... Union. Yeah. Now that said, we have had, again, again, cases, as far as I understand, Google Ireland was a case of that, where they took in European information, got hit for it, and had to pay fines for it. So it's not just that it's applicable to U.S. things. As mentioned, it's likely that we're not seeing as much of it with U.S. because it's hard to enforce against the U.S. work kind of big on this whole, you know, don't own tread on me thing going on with the U.S. And so we're less likely to throw our corporations to the wolves. Right, right. Mm. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So also while I was here, I did notice, so Capital Factory <laughs> actually has an opt-in for their newsletter. This is a perfectly legitimate way of doing exactly this. Is hopefully they do keep the data safely and can show when they're using it, but you have to check a box to get email and also check a box to, you know, oh, agree to the terms and conditions. These are full opt-in consents. By checking this box by yourself, you're opting in, and by hitting continue, you're gonna send that data. So we're seeing this happen regardless. It is pretty basic in some cases, but it's becoming standard, and I think that that's important too, is if you're gonna build new stuff, you really should build some of this in with it, even if it's just this basic, where it's like, yeah, we collect data, yeah, we can show where we collected that data from and why we did it. It doesn't have to be amazing, it doesn't have to be complicated, it just has to be provable. And you're gonna see probably that many courts, regardless of the EU, are going to be pushing on this because we've seen so many problems with data privacy, with data privacy breaches, et cetera, that it's become unreasonable for the average user to expect that they have any a semblance of privacy and be able to do that. And without privacy, we're not gonna be able to do commerce and business. That is an important requirement. If they choose to opt out though, is that for the most part mean they can't so I do have to opt into the T's and C's. That's a standard thing that basically if I get Wi-Fi from McDonald's too, I have to say, look, I'm not going to go do questionable things with that internet, you know, go, oh, oh, you know, on the dark web or whatever, or go, oh, back some terrorist organization and all those things you shouldn't be doing on public Wi-Fi anyway. But if you were doing them, they're like, no, we're not liable because you logged on to public Wi-Fi. Um, this is an opt-in. You can always opt out on the newsletter through unsubscribing. That's legal. That should be fine for what they're doing. I mean, like, so one of these checkboxes is basically saying, like, you agree that, you know, we'll do stuff with your information, right? Um, so the T's and C's, yes, that's going to be in taking your information and doing some tracking on you, if only for security reasons. So, because that's the least they can do. Is the last thing you want to do is get in front of an FBI investigation and be able to say, we don't know what he did, but we know he was here and he did something. 
So you take some basic tracking, some security, that's what your TNC is going to say. Is what we're, yeah, you know. they usually do a lot more than that. Oh, sure. And we can, I mean, we can sit here and read the t terms and conditions if you really want to, but well, I think I'll leave that as an exercise to the well, reader. Well, out of the curiosity, if... Yeah. Well, all right, actually, Daniel, I just answered this. So, in the U.S., yeah. politicians mm -hmm. are exempted from any sort of spam or text messaging thing or anything mm -hmm. like that as far as following regulations. Which is why they can just blindly ignore and email you all day. And text yes. You all day because, like, they are explicitly exempted in the laws around the Can Spam Act. That's right. Like, is there an equivalent of that in the GDPR where politicians are able to just ignore all of that? Not that I'm aware of. Again, okay. politicians seem no, to be completely under just for politicians. What is this? <laughs> I can't imagine. No, so as far as I know, there are no extra provisions for politicians, even charity organizations. Everybody has to say, you opted in, here's where you opted in, you can opt out any time, we can give you your data back, et cetera, et cetera. As far as I understand, this is across the board. If there is any, again, legal counsel thing, things that I haven't found, and more accurately, it's not clearly available. So usually these exceptions or the problems will come up and say, look, this is you know, obviously going to be it. America loves to do this with churches. It's we know, you know, everybody generally knows churches are relatively tax exempt. We're aware of this, you know, how you feel about that is you, but we know this, it's very clear knowledge. The EU stuff has produced only, like basically nothing, as far as I know, nothing about who's exempt from this. It's more who's going to get hit with this versus not. So, and yeah, I would imagine a politician would be more likely to be fined for it and fined as an individual most likely, because that's the other thing I don't see, is this is not like the RIAA stuff with the recording industry back in the mid-2000s, late 90s, where they were fining individuals for music piracy. This is all very company-centric, for better or for worse. Because at some point, your company is a group of individuals that did something they need to be held accountable for as well. In uh, instances of, I guess, larger companies that have internal customers, um, I imagine you um, forfeit your right to that kind of privacy, like you being an employee working on like a, say, sort of company phone or company device, um, that level of tracking, is that, I mean, I imagine that's allowed internally to the company? So again, with the H&M H &M case, arguably no. The company has to have given a very clear explanation of what they're doing with that data, why they need it, why they have you opt in, and as far as I can tell from that case, it was basically said, look, you can't do this. These are unreasonable requirements, and here's a huge fine because you did this. So again, will America probably do something where they're more company-oriented? Probably, but that's me speculating, and I'm not even you know, familiar with legal cases, but this is what I've seen as an IT person, is we tend to favor a lot of big tech companies, and with some benefits, we do get a lot of jobs out of that, and we do control a lot of design work outside of the US, so it's kind of important that we do have these things. So, but yeah, um, there's nothing necessarily stopping the EU law specifically. As far as I understand, the California law and so forth, because there's no precedent, we don't really know. But again, I don't know that there's anything giving them an opt-out or anything like that. But just because just you're in a company and working for the company does not mean that you can't be subject to these new privacy laws and does not mean that they can't be unreasonable and therefore have that company fined. So how explicitly, and it may not be per Daniel's point, how explicit is the GDPR about what counts as a reasonable business use case of needing the data? Not at all. I mean, you're welcome to check the articles, but the basic answer is that you can explain that it's applicable to your business in some way, shape, or form. The point mostly is the consent and then telling your customer as well. So if you tell your customer, we're tracking you because we like balloons, because you know, we want more balloons in the world. That's technically, as far as I understand, okay. You did tell them, and you wanted, and you asked them for consent, and they gave consent. You know, ridiculous example, sure. But as far as the, the actual regulation goes, it's not applicable. It seems to be something that's left to the court itself as to whether it's a reasonable business use. So, like, let's say we went into their terms and conditions. Sure. And they said, uh, by using our website, you consent to, and it, it's a bunch of like PII that I think there's clearly no reason they need it when they're just giving me free Wi-Fi, but they spin some bogus story about some business use case that clearly sounds sketch. Like sure. how much of a case would I have that they're like not in compliance? So you probably have reasonable case of not compliance. The chances of you as an individual is unlikely to be able to do that. Again, this is a reasonable company and you may have of something where they're in, not in compliance, especially if you're an EU citizen, you can go and submit this as to their court and say, look, this is happening to a variety of people. We know this is happening. 
you know, you need to do something about this, but it's less likely to do so. Interestingly, the UK courts seem to do that quite quickly with a lot of uh, websites. They have lower fines for that, but they do actually go into smaller websites and say, look, you're doing these questionable practices. Here's a fine, stop it. I, I you know, I think the, the drift of my question to, was piggybacking on some of the questions other people asked, and just like, you know, can, can the company basically say they want to do really sketchy stuff, justify it, and basically, if I don't want them to do that, well, I basically have to not use their service. So again, as far as I understand, yes, but then also the court is able to go, that was ridiculous, no, here's a fine. So basically, they can get away with it till somebody actually gets annoyed enough to take them to court. Correct, and that's usually the biggest problem we see with the, this law, even in new upcoming laws like the California Privacy Act. It's very difficult to enforce these things. You have to have a reasonable case and apply lawyers to it. So yeah, they can do these things, especially if you're under 250 employees, you can do this. And it just becomes kind of a legal gray area that no one ever touches because it doesn't <coughs> matter. This is mostly designed to hook that big fish at 4%. Mm -hmm. Did you have another question? Anyone else? Okay, great. So I'll do the wrap up then. Yeah. Um, anybody have any final questions? We have the room till nine, but we always can wrap over early if nobody has any final questions, especially anybody who maybe didn't ask a lot. So I guess what I was referring to earlier was, the, let's see if I can get this right. Sure. It was the original Safe Harbor Privacy Principles Agreement, which okay. then got renegotiated as the Privacy Shield but was never adopted and then recently replaced, which is news to me, by the Transatlantic Data Privacy Framework. Okay, so if so I recall correctly, that is a framework. For GDPR. So if I recall correctly, that is a framework that should help you get compliance for GDPR, but does not necessarily a, give you the ability to go, we're GDPR compliant, that's it. That's supposed to be something that's done by your data protection office. It helps, it's supposed to be information about how to do it, I'd have to look into it more heavily. It's been a while since I've looked at that specific framework. Well, it's brand new. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I was gonna say that. But I know I, know I looked at this three uh, months ago at this point. March? Oh, let's see this. Yeah. That would be what I looked at it. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the financial company I was at. And it was like, how do we do this easily? Oh yeah, okay, this looks good. And just kind of went from there. Let's see, I think it was March, March of this year. Yeah, so. We were looking at that then. It was, it, it was again, really if I. Long and nobody's actually managed to read it and understand it. More. Well, that's it. Is that we, you know, the joke goes I have 12 standards, I've introduced a new standard to take them all in, and I have 13 standards. <laughs> and that's what we're seeing. The main thing is GDPR is being enforced by the EU and is actually pushing toward it. And you have a person at your company who's a data protection officer who does this for you, as opposed to some of these things like PCI, where there's never a per se requirement to have anybody there. Um, another question. Sure. Do you make any recommendations for integrations into the development lifecycle and the DevOps pipeline mm -hmm. that may help ensure people who don't have any understanding of privacy are still respecting the principles behind it? This is the hard part, is that training and availability is difficult to find. The closest thing I've found is uh, the company that did Chef made a product called Inspec, which lets you run a number of tests against your cloud and do things like compliance testing for SOC 2, GDPR, et cetera. The rest has been basically you have to code your own at this time, and I think we'll continue to see these as we continue to see companies get hit up with this. For now, it's been a lot of large companies building their own solution, but we'll see both sides of this where you have a consultancy that does this, as mentioned, we can't name any current ones, but we'll see what happens. And then also a lot of people going to things like website builders to avoid this. Has there been any automation of it? Um, besides small GitHub repos that I've used and such, there's not been anything that's commercialized besides, as mentioned, Inspect will do that for you with a reasonable cost. That's a lot of the problem, I think, and that's the reason you're not seeing automatic solutions that are great. The, again, the frameworks ERGs, ERGs will be also able to help with this, as will any website builder, and we'll see what happens. But I think that's one of the reasons we haven't seen a huge amount of commercial solutions just immediately appear, despite this being a pretty big problem for a lot of companies. The other side of this also is, again, we're not seeing a whole lot of small companies run into this as much yet, though that probably will change as we see state laws come in. My question on state laws is, sure. you know, kind of like PCI, like when it first started, 
Right. Yeah. Right. And so as far as I know, there's about a year grace period for a lot of these. Uh, Colorado specifically called out July 2024 for the you need to be in compliance. So that's what they're talking about. Again, I expect this to be delayed heavily as usual. This is usually what happens is that they give you this year, year grace period and then the government goes, hey, we're not even in compliance. Can we really expect anybody else to be? And they delay it. So. Um, you know, PCI, usually we also see the same type of delay with new companies as well as also doing self audits. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see that, but as far as I understand from the Colorado one, it's specifically a year, specifically July, 2024, and new development's supposed to already be compliant regardless. It's just getting old development in, they have time. Yeah. Sorry. That's fine. Well, no, we have the room till nine. Yeah, we have the room till nine. Questions are great. Go. So two questions. Okay. The first one is, so like we're in an EFF meetup, we're privacy advocates, like, yeah. we're big fans of all of this stuff. Is this working? And what could be better? So for my opinion, it's kind of working because we are seeing visible court cases in big fines. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing that I've seen is, and the cookies thing is just kind of a, a chaff thing that you just get extra of, but there are a lot of companies that do really let you scrub your data from them and or pick up your data from them and move it, which is a huge change from what I've seen. The idea that you can move your data from um, one of these services as, you know, oh, to another, there's not a whole lot of competitors, but messaging apps are usually one of the best where you can really move from WhatsApp uh, to, oh, you know, oh, your Samsung or Facebook or other messengers and say, look, I've gotten all my data out of WhatsApp, it's gone, and I can shift that data into some other messenger or that might be more secure is a big change. So we've made progress I think that it would probably be better to do more that is also more focused on how we implement this in a more structured manner. As mentioned, there is not a lot of ways of, here, just take this solution into your company, run it, and it's done. And the more that any of these companies pushes that to make that more reasonable will be helpful. That said, programmers are notorious for having a lot of individualization in code, and so that becomes its own problem. The simplest way I can see that working also is you take your different database layers and have it so they're compliant by itself. And that can be very quickly helpful. Obviously, there's a lot of, that's a very broad, glib interpretation of how to do that. Right. But if everybody's just using the latest a, MySQL, ProExpress, et cetera, and we know it's compliant, you can get that off of, of these things. And some of these, like Postgres, are truly open source and going to be available for that. So you would have like a Postgres action. So like instead of select, it would be GDPR delete would be the action and then it would do its thing. Correct, it's a and secure delete and, and you go. know it exists as part of <laughs> the newest Postgres and okay. you know it's safe because the open source availability right. has been provided. Okay. That's probably the, the quickest way of doing this. The oh. parts beyond that are shoring up previous companies. I know a lot of companies are still in flat files, are still in COBOL, are still in all these things that the EU is not realizing because they've modernized later, whereas we have a lot of companies that are using AS400 still right. and that can be very difficult. But that's like the, so I guess the original intent, my understanding of the original intent was for GDPR was like people are collecting a ton of data because they see data is valuable, mm -hmm. but that creates a ton of risk for our citizens in manipulation into voting for Brexit or whatever. Sure. And, and so that is a, like a bad, that's an externality for that. That's one of the things. So we want to change the idea of data being valuable to data being a liability. Um, is that... That's, is again, that that's a very like wide book interpretation yeah. that is not probably what they're looking for. It's, we know data is valuable. We want people to secure it better and make it mm -hmm. so that you know your own data has value and you can control what you do with it. Gotcha. So it wasn't necessarily attacking the idea of the business model of, like, mining data for value. And it was more intention on... There's a whole ton of data that citizens don't see as valuable, and so mm -hmm. we're going to force them to see the value of it and let them decide where kind of they put it. Sure. I mean, I, I, just thinking of it, I think it's a lot like having cars and then having seatbelts be mandatory. Is uh, we're applying this regulation so that you're a little safer in this progress, and now car manufacturers, in this case companies who do data, have to put these protections on you so that you're a little safer. It's not perfect. You know, you're welcome to go into all the fun statistics about how seatbelts uh, take out more lives than they save or whatever. That's, you know, it's, these laws are always going to be a process. Right. 
but it is progress, in my opinion, has been helpful. Other people, if you have, you know, if you wanted to cry GDPR, this is probably the time to do it. I know there are a lot of problems. Go for it. And, you know, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll just say, even as a programmer, unless you want to go back to 90s static web pages, mm -hmm. modern websites, you can't create those experiences without posting to the server all the dang time. Like, you know, so, you know, it's mm -hmm. like a trade off. So, yeah, I, for the most part, yeah, there are some fun tricks you can do with JavaScript. Uh, fair. And then the other thing is you can do data masking, which is probably the more important thing. Is you can make it so that you're not collecting data on a person, you know it's masked, you know what you're collecting, and it's separated. So that's still possible, and you can not post that to the server as much, but you're still going to do some server interaction, and it's just that much easier to do. Well, yeah, and even with Daniel's example, that technically session cookies are mm -hmm. covered by this. They are. Um, and I guess actually... Something you said in passing that I want to follow up on. So you actually sure. said one, what I would consider good consequence of GDPR is it's almost in a way uh, on modern non-SMS but HTTPS based messaging apps, things like WhatsApp, Signal, and whatnot. You're almost in a way because you've got to be compliant with GDPR and you can export your data from one to another. It's essentially turning modern web-based messaging apps into essentially kind of a federated protocol. The, the law is kind of forcing the technology to allow yes, you to switch no. which product I'm using. Yeah, so the switching is possible. How they give the data to you is the question, which you'll probably see is the more popular ones will have converters between the two. And that'll give you some federation between it, which is fine. We've seen this throughout. Yeah, I'm, I'm not acting didn't. like it's perfect. No, it's, it's it just not. sounded like, huh, yeah. it's kind of driving that yeah. process. It's so. easier, and it's being driven by a, a government that says, look, you have to do this. No longer can you just have your data sit in some binary system or pickle system um, for Python systems to be completely unintelligible by the user. You have to give that data back, and it has to be machine readable in some way. You have to give them the machine to read it if, they, if it's not in like JSON human readable already. Not at all. Exactly. So to me, this just seems like an excuse for everybody to follow in the same protocol uh, jurisdiction across the pond to possibly find another jurisdiction on the other side of that pond. And it, it this really doesn't seem to solve it. So, So, 
I actually agree it's not enough. I think we need to do more. I think we need to more focus on individuals in many cases and also how the state is being used. The tough part is that there are a lot of hurdles for that. The most basic one is educating the individual about how the data is being used and what it's for. And this is a step forward, but it's not necessarily enough by any means. It's important to see these steps forward and keep iterating. Yes. And I keep complaining Sorry. something, but it's not like GDPR is like a one size one fits all. It's going to affect like every country. It, right. So this is just like individual states taking the action to like put more of a focus on this and have their own like jurisdiction, state by state. Correct. Thing to follow. And they're also just following GDPR because it is a big sweeping law from the EU. So this is a big precedent for them. Global now, so yeah. I have So if these are global, uh, if, like, if companies around the globe are having to adhere to this, is it possible for, we I don't know like where GDPR is like, sitting from in Europe, but that to actually like, you know, say, hey, give us that customer data? The customer, I can call The customer can call yeah. Exactly that. You can't really legislate morality, and when you do, all you're going to do, you're going to end up with Enron, you're going to end up with Melvin Capital, you're going to end up with Lehman Brothers, you're going to find ways around it. Sure. So, as a person that, you know, designs and creates secure software, the real answer is to build solutions that are secure from the get-go, that protect privacy from, from, from the ground up or, or from the left to the right. Yeah. Because if you try to do it this way, you don't have to start, but... You know, we have 40 lawyers who can, you know. We need a diversity of tactics. I think we do need laws like GDPR. We also need software that is privacy first and secure. We need a lot of tactics. And I think, I think also like you know some of the things I'm hearing here and uh, people who may know more correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's very useful to think of GDPR's enforcement mechanism essentially like as a digital tariff, and this is a misconception people have about normal tariffs, where who enforces a tariff, it's like the country who implements it. Like if the US puts a, uh, punishes China with tariffs, no, they can't go into China and impose the fines in China. They do it if you want to do business within our borders. Like as soon as it's brought to the shipping place, any company gonna pick it up, which is a US company, they're the ones having to pay the tariffs. So GDPR yeah. is very similar. If you're Facebook, but you have an office in Europe, and you want to legally operate that office, the one in Europe's got to pay the digital tariff, basically. Yeah. Okay. But going back to that, like, on, let's say on the macro scale, people would trust in those companies, and so not a lot of them did opt out, mm -hmm. that still doesn't prevent hacking from happening. No, I don't think this law comprises hacking. There is no one size fits all model. That's why I'm creating trust Well, 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 Ryan, you know. Well, I mean, to your point, that's why one size doesn't fit all. That, but I, I think that's, that's to me why I think GDPR might be just irrelevant, and each of to come up with a solution, and if that solution works best for them, and people hear about it, 
like word of mouth or whatever, they will like naturally go towards that solution in that infrastructure connect protocol. But if every company is left up to their own solutions, we're going to end up with a million Facebooks who don't care about that. No, 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 each company can adopt it and make their own tweaks to it. But then it goes back to what he said. You have 12 standards, you make a new standard, now you've got 13 standards. I mean, I want to believe that you can do that, and that's great. The other thing that I should point out is that it, GDPR isn't necessarily relevant to hacking because, let's say I'm on Facebook and I say, look, I want my data gone, and someone hacks Facebook afterward, my data's gone. No, I didn't say that it was irrelevant to hacking. Okay. I, just, I, I think GDPR might be irrelevant entirely. This is not actually. So we've already involved. seen it's had effects, so it's not irrelevant just yet. I think the other thing is, yeah, you're right. It will need to grow and change unless it wants to become irrelevant. There will be more things that need to be added. We have seen changes from it that have been theoretically positive, but also a number of growing things. And that's as with many, many systems. Yeah. I also add to that, these changes shouldn't become known to the EU. These changes okay. should be coming from the individual corporations who have you know, like, like bits up and things like that, because you know, data breach or whatever. The problem so, is that a lot of these markets these corporations operate in are natural monopolies, so there is yeah. no competitor to go to. Well, and it's not always they data breaches. They really it does their data breaches, and people still line up to use it. They didn't start losing users until yeah. first quarter of this year. And data breaches aren't the only problem here. That You can have completely legitimate sales of people's data that is illegal according to GDPR, but is not illegal according to U.S. law right now. That is a problem because they don't know what's going on with those persons' data. So is supposed to like prevent like breaches? It's supposed to make it easy for users to have some control over their data. Because like take for example Apple when they introduced the app tracking transparency, over eighty percent of users click the don't track me button. Actually ninety four percent. But see that's the point, is because it was one simple toggle and it was a pop up when you started your phone. Yeah. They didn't have to dig through 50 menus. They didn't have to email 20 people. I had to email Nanchi for six months just to get an answer to a question. It wasn't even a data removal. It was a question. But I'm sure Apple has 20 other ways you're trying to you know, you talk to that. Well, that's a different point. The point is, when you make it easy for people to take control of their data, there's clearly a show that they will do it and they want to. And that was the point of GDPR. GDPR was built to let people so, take control of their data easily without having to be lawyers. And also, if the standard is <coughs> that um, you know that the digital system must never violate our privacy, digital systems are privacy violating by definition. I always tell people, if you want to be 100% private, do it in meat space. Digital spaces are literally surveillance spaces by their very nature. Mm -hmm. That's, so, that's so just space. Space. People feel compelled to give up their data. They feel like they have to in order to participate in modern society. So what you said earlier about the ability to exercise control is demonstration of the fact that if given the choice, they will exercise control and retain control over their data. The only reason they give it up now is because they feel like they don't have an alternative and they have to uh, participate in modern society. I mean. How far would we get without our cell phones or, you know? Yeah, and, there, and so every cell phone is a privacy dumpster fire, and yet we're all stuck with them. Well, well, I mean, that's in each space. You're, you're surrounded by surveillance cameras, IR sensors. I mean, we live in a surveillance state to the max. Oh, we don't disagree. <laughs> what what right. we're here with. <laughs> <laughs> Right over the long term. 
And so changing from an opt-out model to an opt-in model basically starves the data collection mining as a value prop as a viable business model in the digital space. And I find that to be really fascinating, and I wonder how effective it is. I mean, it's, I think it's the whole reason you see <laughs> maybe the to like IBM is VR, because like, Apple shut off their data. It's a little more complicated than that. I don't think it's going to be absolute starvation for those companies because the simplest answer is that they just get more people to opt in for more things. Um, again, also just you can bundle a lot of things in your TOU. Uh, again, I'm, I'm a gamer. I'm into you know all the stuff that we're seeing with that. A lot of Epic Games. There's a lot of discussion of how Fortnite and and TikTok, uh, which are two apps, apps that are from China, track a lot of your data and do it completely legally. There's nothing here that says they can't do that. You've agreed to a TOU that says that and. Until you know somebody like the GEU says no, don't do that. Here's a fine for doing that, which I'm sure would be its own fun diplomatic problem with doing it toward a Chinese company. But yes, I mean Fortnite through Tencent gets a lot of that data. As mentioned, TikTok gets a lot of that data. You can get data regardless of opt-in. It does make it more difficult, which I think is some of the point. And then the other thing is also just it makes it a bit safer. The ability to also remove your data is probably the more important thing. And that is probably the most damaging. Because suddenly, you, you know, you have this warehouse of data and then all the customers essentially do a bank run on your data and it's gone. That's a problem. That's a great idea. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's that's good digital activism. Data 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 yeah. data. <laughs> you, and there's nothing illegal about that. It's completely legal for the user. And there's nothing that, the, the only thing they could possibly do is they could try to um, you know, basically keep track of you and say, look, you can't come back. When you delete your stuff, it's gone. But that's really hard to do, especially if you want to get new customers. So, yeah. sorry, yeah. sorry. So, well, what I was going to say is on this question of opt-in, um, has anybody seen any research or heard anything about how well users over in Europe actually understand the questions and the answers that they're making and what they're agreeing to opt into? Yeah, what I've seen is shown that it's still not great. So, as usual, this requires more er, information. I have to get some statistics on that. But yeah, the training has taken time. It's one of the major gripes about GDPR is that it requires suddenly a lot of people to be very familiar with the law, with the regulation, as it were, and be familiar with their data and how it works. It's been difficult to get most people to be familiar with that. It's easy as a programmer to go, oh, of course, it's this, this, and this. And this it all comes down to common separate value format. We delete it from the database. Most people don't deal with that normally, and I think that's been one of the problems. And, and in fairness to some of the, the criticisms of GDPR, no, it would not be a useful law if only people like us who have knowledge can actually take advantage of it. It needs to be easy for the non-tech savvy as well. I'd say at the very least of like, uh, maybe like level of awareness is that, I mean, any kind of UI design you want to minimize your pop-ups that are coming up, it at least causes this level of hesitation, right? So, I mean, even if they don't fully understand what it is, it's like, okay, well, I can't use uh, half my screen for an hour. It's so let me at least take a second. I'm not going to maybe read the whole thing with the pause and the flow, uh, just blindly estimating. Well, I mean, take for example the situation where people have a choice where they can still disagree to some or disagree with something or with full consent and still use the service, right? If that isn't communicated in the UI, how is a person to know that? In which case, it goes back to what I just said earlier about how they still feel compelled to agree in order to participate. That would be a so, dark pattern, which is actually coming up a lot more in law cases right now. Yeah, we, we have that right here. What? So they're called dark patterns. It's where... Or anti-patterns as well. What's the other term? Anti-pattern. Uh, Although no. that's more for kids. I was going to say, anti-pattern typically is something you don't want to do because it's stupid. Dark pattern is um, where it's malicious. Yeah, so dark pattern is basically designed to obscure... Um, it's designed to make resistance. Like, Amazon is a perfect example. I can go online and sign up for an Amazon account right now in two seconds. I know from personal experience, the only way to delete my account is to email customer service three times. Mm -hmm. Like, I email them, they email me back and ask me to confirm it, and then I think it was the third one. I don't know, probably. There's probably so, like, a second confirmation. So what you're talking about where, say that they can click I disagree but still use the service, which, by the way, I found out a couple weeks ago, most healthcare providers, you can do that. Um, you can click disagree and still use the service. They're not going to tell you that, and that's a dark pattern. Right. They're going to make you feel like you have to click I agree. And what were you saying about the 
uh, just it's coming up a lot more. I don't think there is any precedent right now. There are certain anti-patterns, I think, that have been made straight up illegal over the years. I think one or two have been. Yeah, so some of them are the worst ones. But it's, it's coming up a lot more in court cases. I'm definitely, I, I follow a ton of different news sites okay. on privacy and technology, and like, I'm definitely seeing an uptick in uh, dark patterns being brought to the court. My understanding is pre-checked boxes are one of those, and that's become under this as GDPR specifically now no longer acceptable. Gotcha. That's pretty recent within the last six months, if I understand Sweet. correctly. So we are seeing changes to that, but it requires basically a court case every time to say what that dark pattern is. As mentioned, I like is there any deal, but it basically is using exactly that dark pattern. We use cookies. If you use us, you agree. Yeah, great. I hate them. There's no opting out whatsoever. I don't know how to, how to get out of this. There's no disagree button, and as far as I know, I don't know where that is. It's a great I, website. I mean, it's but, literally stuff like that that yeah. inspired Cory Doctorow's legendary email signature, where he basically, his email signature is, no, anything you claim I've agreed to, I do not agree to. <laughs> Fair enough. Absolutely. Oh, that. yeah. So, uh, what used to happen is they used to have like little sign-in things on when we come to meetups or whatever, yes. and you'd have to agree to whatever. I would always, like, my signature would be, I decline. Okay. In person, <laughs> like the signature that I would put in. So mm -hmm. you can, like, if you have a digital signature field. Yep. I highly recommend. It. So, I and I think that's a legal complication because if your signature is the same every time, it's binding. But that's something you'd have to, again, definitely <laughs> check with the legal counsel. Well, there's a lawyer out there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, you bet. <laughs> right? So the usual one is people go from like having a signature to having a drawing, and then suddenly that's binding. I just scribbled. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, my <laughs> scribble's uh, binding. This was just it turned up and down for me with your point was around the cookies tracking. I mean, is, yeah. is it just to my understanding when cookies you can track search terms? Certainly. So the simplest answer is yes, you can just go take your data out of that company and say, don't track me anymore, don't keep my data, anything that you have on this individual with this account needs to be removed. But, okay, so when you're logging into a website first, they ask you to accept that they will be tracking your cookies and then you can... Right, so, and you can also, the good websites let you disagree to that, and that will just delete your specific session of that. And then, then they will let you it depends on the website. Many of them, again, the healthcare ones apparently do let you continue to participate. Regardless, the other things, some of them, you may be able to participate with a reduced ability. So the, the classic one I can point to very quickly is if you boot up a new Windows computer, they talk about ad tracking and whether you're going to get an individual profile for your ads on an uh, edge slash Bing or whether you're going to get a non-personalized ad set. And so that's a, theoretically, you opt out of that, that is a lower usage of it. I usually opt out of it because I don't want to get specifically targeted ads, but in theory that could be a benefit. I'm sure there's many websites that can point out, hey, we track these things and it benefits the user in some truly positive way. There are also several that are more kind of dark patterny, the classic ones being that I'm on some social media website and it's showing my latest Amazon search results. And in order to get out of that, I need to tell Amazon to pull that data and get rid of it. So if you're tracking the user at all, it seems to come up. If you're tracking the user at all, as far as I understand, you are liable in this case. The pixels are often included just to trigger the cookie request. That can be, yes, one way. When the pixel is loaded, that's when the cookie is transmitted. Right. right. So you just attach the JavaScript. But even if it weren't a cookie, if it was just some other piece of data, you're still tracking and you're still liable. Again, this is more likely going to be not as applicable for companies under 250, but as you get bigger and bigger, yeah, any tracking you do on a user is technically data, is technically something you need to tell the user why you're collecting it and let them know that they can get rid of it if they want to. How explicit does it need to be when letting customers know? They need to actively consent to that data tracking. So then, again, it's a very gray writing of that law, in my opinion. They did not say you have to have a checkbox and an accept. They did not say you have to do a digital signature. It is they have to actively consent how that consent is taken and is complex. So, I mean, this does get buried in the majority of these e-commerce cases. Followers. Sure. So, if, if I understand this right, is this basically saying that be a customer, you need to opt in to make that company profitable. 
essentially? Yeah, that's probably accurate. <laughs> There's going to be always companies that don't need your opt-in, that can do weird data stuff. The, the one I love to point out is like Experian does credit reports, and that requires no technical opt-in. And as far as I understand, it still is probably going to be weird about how to opt into you yeah. getting them getting data that's not on you but is in, on you as an entity. Like, credit reporting bureaus are going to be a mess. Made a gray area because yeah, like companies selling data does suck, but then again, there's a positives because it shares uh, you know what you're interested in, and it's just you know companies kind of like buy and dump each other. Sure. They provide a better customer experience. That's a positive side, and that might be like you know overall optimistic. But at the end of the day, if the majority of these companies are making money off advertising, then it's not like we're going to defund Facebook and it's going to. You know, right. Again, you know, I don't think you're going to see. At the end of the day, like other companies and businesses, yes, like humans are innovative; they can come up with other ways to generate their profit. But then at the same time, this is like a pivotal uh, way to generate business in the internet age. So. So yeah, there's a couple things going on here. One is is that you'll probably just see people shift to an opt-in model where you've got clear consent of the fact that they looked for that data and got it. This is gonna make new websites struggle a bit because that opt-in can be difficult and daunting for new customers. It's not gonna probably drain the internet. Like funneling out from the middle class or new businesses. Absolutely, that's an absolutely, yeah. In the creation of new business. This is concerning. Absolute, no, you want to put your credit cards in full web and there, this will create some. Right? They already have their credit cards, so everybody went to Amazon to buy stuff. Instead of going to Walmart.com or Target.com, because Amazon doesn't have credit cards. And so that's an interesting point. Yes, you might also have a third party broker that's doesn't does this consumer consent work for you. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. 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 Yeah, that's a good point.
Well, you see what happens when they or I like you as a company, I want to give it to you. Yeah. And so the more you're transparent about how you're using it and what you're doing with my data, you're getting more and more people opting in. And even better, they're like, what else do you want to know about me? So now they want to be your partner. So that's one thing on the, the user side, yeah. why it should be that is to be more transparent. Apple represents themselves as this privacy protection organization, and they are Completely yeah. Oh, we could it's, go down a whole meetup going down the rabbit hole and the other ways they use I'm just saying, yeah, the brand has to represent yourself as a transparent trust. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because otherwise, you're going to be. I said, you know, don't get caught. Don't <laughs> make it. Why? That's what we're doing. Oh, well, we don't track you. Actually, we track everything you do. Well, all the to the extent that we told you. You would probably burn down our headquarters. <laughs> and that's a way of doing business. That's a choice you make. I know, so, yeah. But it's so. his point. People, you capture a whole lot of stuff you don't want to need to stop it. Yeah. And we're getting and transparency. You're not at risk, and then you're in bounds of honoring the meaning of the past. You said they don't really need it. They have found a way to monetize every single piece of data that they've got. Well, and actually, our, as we all know, everything about it. Not necessarily every piece, I think. This is usually the problem I run into as a consultant is we keep an awful lot of data we don't know what to do with because we think the data is new, the new oil. And that's not the worst analogy. It's just we forget that oil has a lot of refining that you have to go through before you get a usable product. Yeah. And data is definitely like that too. Well, at the same time, Apple and Google, they don't have data where they have predictive analytics that they know. They don't have, they're not listening to your mic. They know you're going to go to the bathroom three times, you're going to go to McDonald's, you're going to your laptop, you're going to talk to your wife. They do. GDPR lets me remove that data at my best. And that's probably the most important takeaway here. Actually, that's going to yeah, go into the I, slides I, here. We could keep debating the two philosophical polls here, but we are out of time. Yep. So, just to wrap up, again. I, I want to give Xander a big round of applause. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So just to wrap up again, as an individual, you can take control of your data and know what you're doing, what they're doing with it. As an employee, you can help companies build these things and make them more private and secure. And as a company, you can and also ensure that data is private and do a better job of working with your constituents and to your customers to know that so you build a better relationship with them. And, as mentioned, uh, I'm Xander. I, so I am looking for work. If you do oh, have, have anything going on, feel free to let me know. I always like to see new projects. And yeah, I do a lot of GDPR and DevOps stuff. Thanks all for coming out. I really appreciate all the great questions. It's been great discussing with all of you.